everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. So it's crazy because this does happen to me, but I wouldn't say it happens often. It's like rarely that this happens to me what happened when I chose to cover this case on YouTube. So when I began my research into this case, I had no idea how crazy it was going to be because the original few articles I read about this case, they were very bare bones, um, gave the details, but very interesting enough to make me want to look further into it. And I really bit off more than I was ready to chew at that moment because once I started digging in, going through newspapers.com, um, finding you know deeper references and deeper articles, I was like, damn what is happening here? What is happening here? I don't know if you've done this when you're reading about a true crime case, but sometimes you'll be going through and you'll be like waiting for that twist or that turn and it never comes and it's very straightforward. And with this case, it was like one twist and one turn after another spiraling all over the place. And at some point I was like, damn, could I have some stability for a minute? Like, could I just have a little bit of straightforwardness just for a second? Because I have not stopped writing with notes and timelines and my hand hurts and I need a second, okay? So I bit off more than I could chew when I first <laughs> when I first dove in. However, over the past few weeks, I've allowed myself to get as far into this case as I could. And now I'm feeling a little bit stunned. I feel much more connected to the case um, because I went so deep and because I spent so much time with it. And I feel very much sad and frustrated on behalf of Diana Copsey, the mother of our victim, 14-year-old Misty Copsey. I feel anger and impatience toward the Puyallup police officers who originally handled this case very poorly, in my opinion, almost to a point where it's baffling how they were allowed to continue to operate with their very clear bias that was blinding them to the reality of what was before them. And then, like I said, there's wild card after wild card popping up throughout this case that had me gasping out loud at points as I went through everything, as if I was watching a movie that were filled with all these plot twists I never expected. And one thing I can say with complete confidence is that the disappearance of 14-year-old Misty Copsey is one of the saddest cold cases I've ever come across. And I think that had this investigation been handled even somewhat properly from the start, it would be solved today. And we would know what happened to Misty. And her mother may have had a moment or two of peace in these last three decades. Misty was last seen by her best friend, Trina Brevard, on September 17, 1992, after they had spent the day together enjoying rides and games at the Puyallup Fair, even though there were several factors that illustrated the contrary, law enforcement spent several months not investigating Misty's disappearance, deciding instead that she was a runaway and villainizing her mother for continuing to insist that Misty had not run away, that she'd encountered foul play. And in fact, this police department referred to Misty as a runaway, even when evidence came out to suggest otherwise, for years. Now, we have a lot to go over today. It's going to be a long video. So go grab some coffee, grab a snack, you know, put your feet up, get a blanket on, get cozy. And while you do that, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Native. I mean, you already know the deal. I love Native and their products so, so much. I use their deodorant and their body wash every single day and every single night, and I have for over two years. And honestly, I'm I'm a loyal kind of person. I never want to use different deodorant or body wash, and that is a fact. Today, I get to focus on my favorite product that Native has to offer, which is their body wash. Native's body washes are made with clean and effective ingredients that are easy to understand Understand and that are naturally derived to help cleanse your skin without anything harsh or irritating. They are always phthalate and dye-free, they're vegan and cruelty-free, and they're made with plant-based cleansers and citric acid for pH balance and to keep your skin extra happy. Now, using these body washes is truly like a spa experience every time. They have the most beautiful, luxurious, and creamy lather. And unlike other body washes, they do not leave my skin feeling stripped and dry. My skin always feels hydrated and silky, and there's never any weird leftover residue. It doesn't feel dry, you know, like tight, like dehydrated. It feels so good. And that's because Native does not use sulfated surfactants. My entire family uses these body washes. Every bathroom, every bathtub, every shower in my house 
has at least one native body wash in it. And not only are you going to feel like you're in a spa, you're also going to smell like it. Using Native's body washes in the shower leaves my entire bathroom and bedroom smelling delicious all day long. And it also leaves me smelling delicious all day long. I often smell something really good around me and I'm like, what is that? And then I'm like, oh, it's me. It's me because these body washes are so, so good. And with a wide range of scents to choose from and new ones being released all the time, there's options for everyone, no matter if you're looking for something kind of sweet, maybe something a little bit more like spicy. I've always said this and I'll continue to say it. No one beats Native in the scent game. I don't know how they do it, but all of their scents are amazing and I love that they never smell artificial. So today I wanted to talk about three of like probably my all-time favorite scents, even though they have the special edition scents and then those come out and then I stray away for a little bit to explore new territory, but I always come back to these three. One, no surprise to anybody, cherry vanilla macaron. I mean, I don't know what to say about this cherry vanilla macaron scent besides to tell you that it is everything. It is sweet and fragrant and fresh smelling all at the same time. Something about this scent triggers a very nostalgic feel-good memory in me and I love it. Second, once again, talk about this scent all the time, the citrus and herbal musk. I love this scent. I love wearing it with the matching deodorant because then I smell like it and people are always complimenting Commenting me when I have this on. And lastly, sea salt and cedar. When I'm feeling a little bit more dark and cloudy, you know, like October morning vibes, it's overcast, light a candle, use sea salt and cedar, and you're transported. And right now, you can give your personal care routine its own autumnal moment with Native's new Fall Escape collection featuring vanilla cactus flower, desert grass and sandalwood, honey and cigarro, and sweet citrus. You can trade the conventional familiar sense of fall for the alluring sense of the Southwest autumn. And as always, I have a great deal for you, a great way for you to try Native's body washes out for yourself. Three body washes would normally be $27, but if you use the link in the description box and enter code STEPHANIEH36, you'll get them for $18. That's over 33% off. This is a great deal and a great way for you to try out some of the delicious scents I've been talking about for years. So once again, use the link in the description box and then use code STEPHANIEH36 to get three body washes for $18. They would normally be $27. This is 33% off. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Before I get started, I wanted to let you know that I used a lot of online resources to research this case and buy far the most helpful and information-packed articles that I found was a three-part series titled The Stolen Child, posted by the News Tribune in June of 2015 and written by someone named Sean Robinson. Now, this was a very well-done, thorough series laid out in a perfect linear timeline with the occasional side quest for a little creative flourish, which is exactly how I like my reporting. And when I tell you the amount of shade thrown by Sean Robinson towards law enforcement and how it was actually very delicious to read because it's accurate in this case and it's deserved. It never felt like bullying. It never felt like too much. In fact, I think that somebody could make a three-part series specifically tearing these law enforcement officials to shreds and it would never feel like overkill. So in part one, Robinson writes that the Puella police have said they did everything they could in Misty's case. And then he goes on to say that records of their investigation, which were obtained by the News Tribune via public disclosure, which basically means, you know, um, a FOIA request, like you have the right as a journalist or a private citizen to request certain documents relating to, you know, criminal cases, things like that. Anyway, Sean Robinson says these documents that they obtained illustrate the sum of these police officers' efforts. And he goes on to sort of list these efforts, right, in a very shady way. And he says, one, they presumed Misty was a runaway, and in the first critical months of the investigation, they pursued that line of inquiry and no other citing standard procedure. I recognize this. They kept saying, well, this is standard. Okay, when a, a person of this age like a teenager goes missing and there's no like clear physical proof that they were abducted, 
we are supposed to consider them a runaway. I don't know if that was the truth back then in in the 90s or in that general area of, of Washington, but I will say that's ludicrous. Sean Robinson goes on to list things that the police did. The police contributed to Misty's investigation. They discounted the possibility that Misty had been abducted and killed, although investigators from neighboring law enforcement agencies, specifically the King County Sheriff's Department, believed Misty was a victim of foul play and most likely no longer alive. The Puala police looked into Misty's mother, Diana's background, found it shaky and labeled her as a dishonest drunk, pretty much to anyone who would listen. I mean, they they said these things in like the paper. They said them on like radio shows. They talked to each other behind the scenes about this. Just absolutely very hard to read. The police, specifically one police officer named Sergeant Herm Carver, who we're going to talk about, uh, they interviewed a pair of eighth grade girls who went to Misty's school but didn't even really know her that well. And based on these two girls' claims that they'd seen her at the fair or heard from her since her disappearance, the Puyallup police closed the case, removed Misty from NCIC, which is the National Missing Persons Database, and then literally told the media that they'd found Misty and her mother knew exactly where she was, which were direct, straight-out lies. Like, no way around it. Those were lies allegedly don't come for me, but I'm, they were lies. So when articles of clothing that Misty had been wearing that night that she vanished were found, the police suggested that Diana, Misty's mother, had planted them. <laughs> planted the because that's what a mother would do. When your daughter's missing, you want to, you know, plant things in the investigation that will lead the police officers down the wrong path. It was more than five months after Misty's disappearance before police questioned the two people who saw and spoke to Misty the night of the fair. And law enforcement would later learn that both of these people had, once again, I will say lied, but Sean Robinson of the News Tribune says they concealed information about their actions that night. They lied. One of these people would become a suspect in the case, and investigators didn't even figure out for a year that he had no explanation for his whereabouts the night of Misty's disappearance. No alibi. He he blacked out, right? And by that time, as you would expect, any forensic evidence was long gone. So I will link these three articles by Sean Robinson of the News Tribune in the description box if you're interested in reading them. But for now, let's jump into the details of the missing persons case of 14-year-old Misty Copsey, who was failed by the people who only had one job. And that one job was to find her or figure out what had happened to her and then bring the person responsible to justice. Because in my opinion, whether we're talking about 1992 when Misty disappeared or 2023 when we are currently talking about this case, there was nothing that these police officers should have seen which would have suggested Misty Copsey was a runaway. So I don't know what they were doing. Anyways, let's talk about Misty. Known to be straight-laced and a competent student who always brought home good grades, Misty Copsey was born on March 10, 1978 to her parents, Diana and Paul Buck Copsey. Misty was born into a little bit of chaos, with her parents separating shortly before her birth. Some sources say they separated shortly after her birth, but either way, Misty was very young, when her parents were no longer together, and she ended up spending most of her time with her mother, who unfortunately had developed an alcohol problem over the years. But despite this, Misty still seemed to excel at life. She'd earned a certificate for excellence in math in her seventh grade class at Spanaway Junior High School. She was also very athletic, playing softball, basketball, and volleyball. And apparently Misty gave everything to the sports that she played because one time she broke both of her forearms after a hard fall during practice. In school, Misty was very popular, known to be charismatic, friendly, quick to laugh with a really goofy and playful side that made her immediately relatable and easy to approach. Standing at five foot eight with thick blonde hair and vivid green eyes, Misty was also starting to draw the attention of boys. Remember, she's 14. She's five eight already, uh, which is bananas to me because I am almost 40 and I am only 5'4", probably less than 5'4 now because I'm shrinking. But Misty at 14 was just willowy, tall, gorgeous, fun to be around, smart. She really had everything going for her. So, of course, the boys in her school and sometimes outside of her school 
were going to start kind of hovering around like flies. But according to everyone who knew Misty, she was very straight-laced, which meant no drinking, no drugs, and no boys. And this does seem pretty consistent across the board. You know, sometimes you'll hear from, like, the victim's family, oh, no, she would never do anything like that. She didn't drink. She didn't do drugs. She was, uh, you know, not having sex. And then you'll talk to the person's friends, and they'll be like, you know, she was wiling out all the time. She was very rebellious. With Misty, this was just true across the board, very straight-laced, stayed away from anything that would kind of, I guess, divert her from her path. But even though Misty herself wasn't particularly interested in or actively pursuing boys, she did have a lot of friends. Like I said, people were drawn to her, and some of these friends happened to be boys who may have had an interest in being more than friends with Misty, something she was not at a place in her life to entertain, because she was 14. Now, one of these boys, who I really shouldn't even call a boy because he was 18 years old, so technically he was a man, one of these males who was interested in Misty was named Ruben Schmidt, and he lived in Green Meadows, a trailer park on South Hill Road in Puyallup, Washington, where Misty and her mother had also lived until early 1992 when Diana Copsey moved them into a duplex in Spanaway, 12 miles away. Because Misty made so many friends wherever she went, she was able to develop a new friend group in Spanaway while still keeping in touch with many of her friends from Puyallup, including Ruben Schmidt, who her mother did not like. Not only was Ruben a high school dropout who just didn't seem to be doing anything productive with his young life, but he seemed to have an interest in Misty that went beyond an innocent flirtation. So one day while Misty was on the phone with Ruben, Diana had picked up the extension and some of you younger people will not understand this because we don't have home phones anymore. We all have cell phones. But back in the day when I was young, we had one home phone number and, you know, one or two different extensions to that phone number throughout the house. So even if you had your own phone in your room and you were like talking on the phone to your friends, your mother could pick up the extension in like the living room and, and listen into your conversation. And if your mother was good enough, like my mother, she'd pick up the phone, hit mute and you wouldn't hear anything. You would hear nothing. You wouldn't know that she was there. So there was no privacy. There was no privacy. So Diana picked up the extension when Misty was on the phone with Ruben. And she heard this 18-year-old man telling her very young daughter some incredibly inappropriate things. Dirty talk, essentially. And after this, Diana had made it very clear to Misty that she didn't want her daughter to associate with this older, scraggly-haired man who'd already shown an eagerness to cross the line with a girl much younger than he. And yeah, this probably upset Misty, you know, like, it's my life, you can't control it, I can talk to whoever I want, I can handle myself, etc., etc. But even so, Misty and her mother Diana seemed to have a good relationship, and they would often crawl in bed together after a long day and cuddle, falling asleep in the safety and comfort of each other's arms. Something that today, Diana Copsey very much remembers and misses. September 17th, 1992 was a Thursday night, and the Puyallup Fair, which is now called the Washington State Fair, was in full swing, running throughout the month of September. This fair started in 1900, and today is the largest single attraction held in Washington State. In 1991, the year before Misty went missing, it drew in over 1.4 million people. And this is 1.4 million people coming into a community that usually had, I think, 24 to 25,000 people in it tops. So during fair times, as you would imagine, things in Puyallup would get a little chaotic, right? There was just tons of people that, that weren't normally there around. And this does bring a dangerous element sometimes to a normally small and safe town. But basically, the Puyallup Fair was just the best thing going. You know, it was a fun time for people who were coming from outside the area to visit. It was a fun time for people who lived in the area. And they had a world-class rodeo. They would have like a star-studded lineup of musical performances, petting zoos, parades, and of course, fun rides. In Puyallup, a town with a population of about 26,000, the fair meant an opportunity to break free from typical routines and to let loose, which is exactly what Misty Copsey and her best friend Trina Brevard wanted to do that night. And as most teenage girls of that age have a tendency to do, they wanted to exert their independence and attend the fair alone without parental supervision. 
Misty and Trina begged Diana to allow them to attend the fair by themselves, and at first Diana answered with a firm no. She worked overnights caring for elderly individuals, and that night she was going to be at the home of an 87-year-old Alzheimer's patient, so she'd be unable to leave and go pick the girls up that evening because she was going to be working and she can't leave her you know, elderly Alzheimer's patient alone. Misty told her mother not to worry. She was responsible after all, and she had checked the schedule and found that there was a bus leaving Puyallup and heading to Spanaway at 840 p.m. She and her friend Trina would be able to take that and be home within no time. The only problem was they would need to tell a little white lie for this to all work, and they would need Diana to act as their accomplice because Trina's mother, Marlene, would not let her daughter go to the fair unless Trina had a ride home. So Misty and Trina asked Diana to help them out. Just tell Marlene that she would be driving them home. Reluctantly, Diana, wanting to be the cool mom and show trust in her daughter, agreed to go along with the story. Diana pulled up to the Puyallup Fairgrounds with two excited teenage girls in her car around 3.15 p.m. And before they darted out, she gave them a dire warning that would end up being prophetic for Misty. She said, you better not screw up. If you screw this up, it's going to be the last time you do anything. Before Misty left her mother's car, she exchanged I love yous with her. And then Diana watched Misty walk away. And Diana remembered thinking how small Misty looked. Because that evening, Misty, wanting to look grown up, had asked to borrow her mother's new jeans. These were baggy, stonewashed denim jeans with fancy stitching on the pockets. And Misty, because she was 5'8", you know, her mother Diana was also tall, so they were kind of around the same height. And because Misty was 5'8", and she could kind of share clothes with her mother, Diana Diana agreed. But Diana remembered watching Misty walk away wearing these jeans and a navy blue sweatshirt and brown suede shoes. And she said, wow, Misty looks so small and frail in these jeans. They're so baggy on her. You know, Misty had had to roll up the cuffs because she wasn't quite as tall as her mother. But Diana just remembered thinking like, you know, she looks like a little girl wearing my jeans. And even though Diana had this very, you know, sort of sentimental moment she would have no way of knowing it was the very last time that she would see her daughter forever. Around 8.45 that night, the phone rang at the home of Diana's Alzheimer patient, and when she answered it, she heard Misty's voice. Misty told her mother that she'd missed the bus to Spanaway, but it was okay because she thought that she could grab a ride with her old friend, Ruben Schmidt. Diana told Misty, absolutely not. She said, under no circumstances, so should you get into a vehicle with this guy? Because Diana didn't trust Ruben based on the things she'd heard on that call, which I would like to tell you. I will tell you. Okay, so Ruben told Misty, like, oh, Misty, you have no idea how horny you make me, right? That's what he said to her on the phone that Diana heard. So Diana's like, based on that, I don't want you to get into a vehicle with this person alone in a car at night because I don't feel that she'll be protected. And Diana knew that Misty had this little electronic organizer with her that she just got in. She kept it in her purse, and it held you know, phone numbers, addresses, birthdays, those kinds of things. I had one, too. Um, back in the day, they were the best. It was like an early version of the cell phone, except you couldn't actually send messages or make calls, but you could store notes, and you could store people's birth dates and you know, phone numbers and things so that if you were out and about and you had to use a payphone, you could find a number that you needed. So Diana told Misty to go through her organizer, find someone else's number, call around, and get a ride home from a different person. Misty said she would, and she said she would call her mother back when she knew who was going to be bringing her home, but that call never came. As it got later, Diana tried to ignore her racing heart, her racing thoughts. She told herself that Misty must have made it home okay, and she'd just forgotten to call. But when Diana dialed their home phone number, no one answered. Diana once again tried to calm herself, tried to reason with herself. She said Misty probably got home, she was tired from all the fun she'd had at the fair, and she'd fallen asleep. And she was just too deep into sleep to be woken up by the ringing phone. Diana told herself, when I get home later, Misty will be there, as she always has been, tucked safely into her bed. But when Diana finally opened the front door of her house hours later, and she made her way to Misty's room. She found it to be dark and empty. Misty's bed was not slept in. Misty was not there. Diana immediately dialed 911, and she told the dispatcher that her 14-year-old daughter was missing, hadn't come home from the fair the night before. 
But she was informed that this situation sounded more like a runaway case and the police wouldn't do anything for at least 30 days. Diana hung up the phone in frustration and she picked it back up and she dialed Trina Brevard's number. Remember, Trina was the friend that Misty was with at the fair the night before, but no one picked up. Next, Diana called Reuben Schmidt, the person that Misty had told her she was going to get a ride from. And so Diana's thinking, well, maybe Misty couldn't find anybody else, didn't want to call me and let me know that she was actually getting a ride from Reuben. And so maybe Reuben would know something. And Reuben did confirm that Misty had called the night before asking for a ride, but he told Diana that he didn't have enough gas to go and pick her up. After this frustrating set of phone calls, Diana left the house and went directly to the Pierce County Sheriff's Office, arriving around 1.40 p.m. Once there, Diana was told that the information she'd received in regards to law enforcement waiting 30 days to investigate was false. However, even though Misty lived in Pierce County, she would have to file a report with the Puyallup Police Department, which is also in Pierce County. So to me, this never made any sense. But regardless, this would kick off the involvement of two law enforcement agencies being involved with Misty's case from the beginning, which I don't know if that helped or hurt. I want to say it helped, but I also think it could have hurt in some ways because what I'm kind of getting an idea of is that the Puyallup police would investigate like criminal cases, abductions, murders, things like that. It would be the Pierce County Sheriff's Department to investigate things like runaways, right? Which is what, you know, Misty was being classified as from the beginning. So it kind of seemed like neither um, law enforcement agency wanted to sort of claim Misty's case or take responsibility for it because they didn't really know what it was. But at the sheriff's office, there was one person who was there when Diana came in to fill out a report, and this person paid attention to what Diana had to say, and that was Tammy Horner, a part-time employee of the Pierce County Sheriff's Office Juvenile Division. Horner went to her supervisor, Captain Gary Smith, and she told him, listen, there's one thing keeping me from accepting that Misty Copsy is a runaway, and that's the fact that she called her mother the night before and said she missed the bus and she was going to get a ride home. Why would a runaway do that? In response, Captain Smith assigned Deputy Brian Koberg to the case. And Koberg did basically nothing. Okay, like I'm not going to lie. Koberg did basically nothing. He sort of questioned some of Misty's friends to see if they knew where she was or if they'd heard from her. And I don't know who he talked to. Like I still am a little um, suspicious or skeptical that he even talked to anybody because basically he wrote in his report like nobody knew anything and he told them to call if they remembered anything or if Misty happened to contact them. And like I said, that's pretty much all he did. What it does look like he didn't do is talk to Trina Brevard, Misty's best friend and the person she'd been with the night of her disappearance. What it looks like he didn't do was talk to Ruben Schmidt, the guy that Misty told her mother she was going to get a ride home from. What it doesn't look like he did is pretty much anything of substance. So later that afternoon, when Trina Brevard returned home from school, she heard messages that Diana had left on her answering machine, and she called Diana back. And she said she didn't know where Misty was. Trina claimed that after they had missed the bus, she had decided to walk home. Trina had decided to walk home. And the last time she'd seen Misty, Misty was at the bus stop. It would not be discovered until much later. Much later. Um, but as it turns out, Trina was not being completely honest with Diana about what had happened that night. She hadn't walked home after all. She'd started to walk home, but then she'd ended up getting a ride from her boyfriend, a 23-year-old named Mike Reiner. And please don't forget that at this time, Trina Brevard was just 15 years old, and her boyfriend, Mike Reiner, was 23. <laughs> I can't even... With no answers from Trina, Diana called Ruben Schmidt again because she definitely felt like he knew something. And Diana would remain suspicious of Ruben for years after. I, I would say she probably still is. When Diana called Ruben, he wasn't home, but she did speak to his roommate, James Tinsley, who informed her that Ruben and his uncle had in fact gone to pick Misty up from the fair the night before. So Diana's like, what the hell? I'm getting all these mixed messages from Ruben. And then his roommate James said he did leave. So what's going on? So Diana called Ruben back. And when she finally got him on the phone, she demanded to know where Misty was. And Ruben said he didn't know. He also said, no, no, my roommate James, that dumbass, he got this all wrong. He must have heard incorrectly. I never went to pick Misty up. I was at a party. <laughs> 
This party was never brought up again, as far as I could tell, and once again, it doesn't look like anybody from law enforcement ever checked Ruben's alibi to see if he was at a party, and it wouldn't really matter anyways, because like I said, he never brought it up again, so he can never say whose party it was or where it was, and his version of events that night would change. Over the course of the following week, Diana said that Ruben would stop by her house and ask her if she'd heard anything or if the police knew anything about Misty. And then when Diana would say no, Ruben would take off as quickly as he had arrived. Now, because law enforcement wasn't conducting an actual investigation of any kind, Diana herself tracked down a man named Mark Veach, and he was the bus driver who drove the Spanaway route the night that Misty had vanished. Diana showed Veach Misty's picture, and he said he had seen this girl in downtown Puyallup around 9.20 p.m. He said the girl had asked him when the next Spanaway bus would be by, and he said he just returned from driving it, and there was no more buses from Puyallup to Spanaway that night. Mark Veach tried to explain to Misty that she could take the bus to Tacoma and then transfer to another bus that would bring her to Spanaway. But as he was talking, she began walking away before he could even get this information out. And he said that Misty turned around and walked away into the night looking distressed. On September 23rd, when Misty had been missing for six days, Diana filed a report with the Puyallup Police Department. And here at the police department, she was told to calm down. They said Misty ran away. She'd come back. Later, Diana explained her experience at the Puyallup Police Department saying, quote, they just looked at each other with that kind of look, you know. Then they said 99.9% .9 of the kids come home on their own. She'll be fine. End quote. Although the Puyallup PD was apparently uninterested in Misty's whereabouts, Captain Gary Smith, the Pierce County Sheriff's Office commander, was less convinced of Misty's runaway status. He also happened to be in charge of YES, which stands for Youth Emergency Services, and that was the county's runaway team. So Smith knew the statistics and the signs of a runaway teenager better than probably almost anyone in the area, and something about Misty's case made him take pause. On September 24th, Gary Smith faxed some records over to Sergeant Herm Carver at the Puella Police Department. And as a heads up, Herm Carver, in my opinion, was a real piece of work, probably the biggest dick I've encountered in a true crime case in a long time, if not ever. And I honestly don't know what this dude's problem was, but he should have like written poetry or taken a long walk or gone to therapy instead of taking out whatever emotional damage he was holding on to on the victims that he was supposed to be helping because I don't know what this guy's problem was. I don't know what his status is now, but I did find out that the Puyallup Police Department still gives out an award called the Herm Carver Problem-Oriented Policing Award. As recently as 2019, they gave it out at least. And I'm not sure if this is supposed to be like an inside joke or like sarcasm, because from what I gather, at the time of Misty's disappearance, Herm Carver's way of solving problems was by pretending they didn't exist and gaslighting the shit out of anyone who dared to question him. So anyways, Captain Gary Smith sent Carver some documentation related to Misty's case, and he attached a personal note that he wrote, and this note said, quote, this is one of those just don't feel right reports. It's been a week and nobody has heard from the girl. Mom is contacting the media, complaining cops aren't doing anything. End quote. So on September 25th, two Puyallup police officers were sent out to the fairgrounds and they questioned some workers. You know, the workers from the fair, like they live there temporarily when they're there for a full month. And there was this grassy lot near the fairgrounds that these people were like living in trailers and tents on. And so the police went there. And they were like, hey, did you guys see this girl? But none of these people reported seeing Misty, so the police officers left. Job well done, fellas. I feel like that is the most you could have done. The most. Or the least. The, the bare minimum. Now, what these police officers did see while they were at the fairgrounds were flyers that Diana had made with Misty's face and information on them posted everywhere because she was the only one doing anything actionable at this time. Meanwhile, Sergeant Herm Carver was skeptical of Gary Smith's intuition and experience in runaways, you know, experience that far outweighed Sergeant Carver's experience with runaways because remember, the Pierce County Sheriff's Office is the one that handles runaways, whereas the Puyallup police was the one who would handle like actual abductions and murders and, and crimes and things like that. So Carver is acting like he knows more about what makes a runaway case than Gary Smith, who ran, yes, the Youth Services Division. Anyways, Carver had no doubt 
that Misty was a runaway. And he set out to prove it, right? So instead of setting out to find out what had happened to her without any bias, without any preconceived notions, in my opinion, he basically went out there looking for information that he could point to and say, aha, I was right. The girl ran away. So to do this, Carver spoke to Misty's biological father, Buck Copsey, who was a firefighter. And honestly, I don't know much about Buck. There's not a lot out there about him. Um, I don't even know how much he was involved in Misty's life. But I tend to feel that there wasn't much quality time being spent with Misty on Buck's part. And for some reason, for years, Buck would continue to insist that his daughter was a runaway. And he would tell the police like, oh, she ran away from her mother because her mother's like this wretched alcoholic and this, this, and that. And that's why I left her. And the weird thing is like, if Buck is making these claims that Diana Copsey had some alcohol problems, which she did, but that it was so bad that Misty would run away from it, how did Diana get custody? And why didn't Buck try to take Misty from Diana if he was so concerned about Diana's alcoholism? For the life of me, I cannot understand why Buck, Misty's father, was never looked at as a suspect, really. Because it seems weird that you would be a loud voice in support of your own child running away when no one would ever hear from her again. And I mean years later, four years later, five years later. Nobody had heard anything from Misty, and Buck Copsey was still saying this. So from Buck Copsey, Sergeant Herm Carver got what he wanted, an ally, and someone who had no problem filling him in on every bad thing that Diana had ever done. Buck told Carver that Diana had a drinking problem, she'd gotten several DUIs, as well as a 1985 welfare fraud conviction. Now, at the time of this conviction, Diana was young, broke, a single mother, and she had readily admitted to her welfare officer that for two months she'd been employed while collecting food stamps. Two months. That's it. Two months. She said there was a, a two-month overlap, and then she fessed up to it. Now, not only was Diana honest about this, but she repaid her debt, and she never did anything like that again. So basically, Herm Carver and Buck Copsey are like, let's just slander this woman. Like, let's just make her background uh, look as, as terrible as possible and not look at any context or any gray areas. But in fact, it was a runaway report that Diana Copsey had filed with the police on August 24th, just a few weeks before Misty went missing, that really put the nail into the coffin. Diana had reported Misty missing, and later she explained this, and she said that she and Misty had argued that day and Misty had left the house. And when Diana couldn't locate her daughter for several hours, she panicked. She called the police and reported that Misty had run away. But as it turned out, Misty had returned home shortly after leaving, and she'd been in her room the whole time. But Diana was too embarrassed by her, what she thought was to be a stupid mistake, to call the police and let them know what happened. So that report remained on file. So now Sergeant Herm Carver has a report to point to and say, oh, see, Misty has a history of running away. Therefore... She's a runaway. On September 29th, Sergeant Herm Carver visited Spanaway Junior High School and spoke to two eighth grade girls, Misty Matthews and Jill Weingar. And these two girls had called the police and claimed they had information about Misty Copsey. Now understand that by the time Carver went to Misty's school, he already knew what their information was. And this is why he brought Diana Copsey along with him, because he wanted to show her, see, your daughter's not missing. She's a runaway. And also understand that Carver did not go to Misty's school to speak to her friends or her teachers to see if there was anybody suspicious hanging around her or anybody that he should be looking into that might have done something to Misty. He went there specifically to interview these two girls who had contacted him with their tips. And after he heard what they had to say, he left. So Misty Matthews, one of these eighth grade girls, claimed that Misty Copsey had called her from Olympia the week before. That's also an area in Washington. And this Misty Matthews girl said that Misty Copsey was alive and okay. So Diana asked the girl if she was sure it had been Misty on the phone. And Misty Matthews responded that, you know, she wasn't positive because the person hadn't identified themselves, but it sounded like Misty's voice. Now, Diana was very skeptical because she knew pretty much all of her daughter's friends, but Misty Matthews was not among them. Diana felt the same way about Jill Wyengar, the other eighth grade girl with information. Jill claimed that she'd actually seen Misty on September 21st, four days after she was reported missing. And this had happened while Jill was at the Puyallup Fair attending the Color Me Bad concert. Now, neither of these girls gave any proof or evidence that what they were saying was true. Yet, to Sergeant Herm Carver, their reports made him feel like this case was closed. This grown-ass man, this grown-ass man 
who's in law enforcement, who's supposed to be trained in like investigating cases and figuring out which evidence is solid and which is circumstantial and which is kind of just like hearsay. This grown ass man listened to what these little girls had to say and he took their rumor and speculation as cold, hard fact. And then he left the school with Diana and he told her he was done looking for Misty. She was a runaway and he was going to be removing her from NCIC that day the National Missing Persons Database. And this, I can't wrap my head around it, right? Because even if a person, a teenage girl ran away, is she not still considered missing until you find her? Is it not still possible and even more likely that she'll encounter foul play while she's out running away? She's 14 years old still. She's in an age group where she's, you know, not protected. She's not old enough to handle herself. She doesn't have her own money. She doesn't have any place to go. Could it be that while she was out running away, she was still abducted? Why in the world these police officers thought that being a runaway automatically like protected you from any you know criminal activity happening to you? I don't understand. And he removed her from the National Missing Persons Database. What a dick. Like, th- for the life of me, I just cannot understand what would make somebody so cold-hearted, so hard-headed, and so absolutely unfeeling for a 14-year-old girl who was out there in the world unprotected, and he did not give a shit. Misty was clearly a runaway, Carver later wrote in his notes, and because of his ignorant tunnel vision, Herm Carver didn't interview Trina Brevard, and he didn't interview Ruben Schmidt. Years later, in 2008, Misty Matthews, the girl who said that Misty Copsey had called her from Olympia, she would be interviewed by the News Tribune, and she would say that she and Misty Copsey were never close, but she wished they had been, saying, quote, I wanted to be her friend, to be a part of the cool kids. I just remember that I wanted to be a part of her circle, end quote. So did Misty Matthews actually receive a call from Misty Copsey? Probably not, right? I would say definitely not. Maybe she received a call from somebody who was pretending to be Misty, like weird people who get involved in cases and then just like prank call people and um, try to cause as much pain as possible. But I definitely don't think the real Misty called. And it could also be that Misty Matthews was kind of just looking for a way to attach herself to this girl that she'd always admired, looked up to, and wanted to be friends with. So the day after closing the case, Sergeant Herm Carver had the audacity to speak to a Seattle radio station. And this is when he told them, and everybody who was listening, that Misty was alive and well, and her mother knew exactly where she was. This obviously caused a ripple effect in the community after this news got out because why would the police say Misty was alive and that her mother knew where she was if she wasn't and she didn't? Local businesses started removing Misty's flyers from their store windows and people stopped looking for Misty because she was just a runaway after all. While the Puyallup police were doing a bang-up job of not looking for missing Misty Copsey, a neighboring law enforcement agency was waist-deep in an almost decade-long investigation into a mysterious serial murderer that they had started calling the Green River Killer. On July 15, 1982, the body of 16-year-old Wendy Lee Caulfield was found by two teenage boys riding their bikes across the bridge of the Green River in Kent, Washington. Caulfield was from Puyallup, but she'd also last been seen in Tacoma, Washington. Within a month, the bodies of Deborah Lynn Bonner, Marsha Faye Chapman, Opal Charmine Mills, and Cynthia Jean Hines were also found on the banks of the Green River. This began an investigation that the King County Sheriff's Office would be embroiled in for decades, chasing a nameless, faceless monster as the body count rose and the investigators always seemed to remain one step behind. Now, this seemingly unrelated investigation would bring someone into Diana Copsey's life and into Misty's case. And this would be a 26-year-old man named Corey Bober. In October of 1992, when Corey Bober became involved with Misty's case, he was already deeply involved in another case, that of the Green River Killer. And Corey believed that he, without a doubt, knew who the mysterious serial killer was. Bober was an early iteration of the armchair detective, and since the killings had started in 1982, he'd spent much of his free time poring over everything he could find out about these young women turning up dead along the SeaTac Strip. Bober believed the Green River Killer was a former acquaintance of his, a man named Randy Atchziger, and Bober claims that during a conversation, Atchziger had told him a piece of information about the Green River Killer case that had not been made 
public and at that time was supposedly a heavily guarded secret kept by the Green River Killer Task Force. Atchsager claimed he'd heard this detail from a drunk police captain at a wedding, but Bober was suspicious of his story, and from then on he began to build a case against Randy Atchsager, a case that in his mind 100% proved that Atchsager was the Green River Killer. Corey Bober began to harass the police department with his theory, and when they dismissed him, he went to the media, claiming that law enforcement was either refusing to follow his carefully curated leads or worse yet, they were intentionally covering for a serial killer. For a time, these tactics seemed to work, and Atch Seiger's name was added to an already lengthy list of potential Green River suspects. However, Randy Atch Seiger was reportedly investigated thoroughly by law enforcement, and they claimed they could find no link between him and the multiple deaths of women in the area. King County Sheriff James Montgomery announced, quote, His allegations have been investigated by the task force detectives and found to be without substance. It would appear that Mr. Bober is obsessed with this issue and will not accept the fact that his suspect is not the Green River Killer, end quote. Now, this obviously did not satisfy Corey Bober. It kind of fueled his fire even more, and he started to make subtle threats. If the police didn't do something and make an arrest, he would take care of Randy Atchsiger himself. And Bober began conducting his own investigation, hanging around Atchsiger's house, filling binder after binder with information about Atchsiger, including known acquaintances, past and current addresses, employers, vehicle-driven, if there was any contact with law enforcement, family history, everything, okay? Corey Bober could have built Randy Atchsiger's family tree on genealogy.com. And obviously, Corey was trying to dig up dirt on Atch Seiger, and he even had an old girlfriend of Randy's call him one night, and he recorded their conversation, and apparently this was sort of awkward because Corey Bober would do this a lot. He would record conversations with Atch Seiger, and so by this time, Atch Seiger had sort of picked up on the fact that Corey was like trying to set him up, and so in this phone call, he's like, oh, you know I'm not the killer, and I know that Corey Bober is listening, and he's like a crazy person, and he's been like setting the police police on me and I'm not a killer and I'm sick of this person, Cory Bober, like harassing me and not like letting this die. So Cory Bober would basically spend every spare minute he had looking into the Green River killer cases, um, trying to compare and contrast, putting together similarities, timelines, everything. And it was September 13th, 1992, when Cory was once again burning the midnight oil, examining his carefully cataloged Green River killer notes and timelines when something clicked, and he noticed what he thought was a pattern. In journals where Cory Bober made notes about his activities and observations, he wrote, quote, I'd finally organized all homicides and missing person cases in list form chronologically. In all cases, I was looking at and comparing victims, checking where they were last seen, when they were last seen, where they were found, when they were found. I discovered several apparent patterns. Some victims had disappeared on the very same date that others were discovered. Some victims seemed to almost commemorate the deaths or discoveries of others. One would die on a particular date, and another would disappear a year to the day later on the very same date. End quote. Corey Bober was also specifically drawn to the cases of two Puyallup girls, 15-year-old Kimberly Delange, who was murdered in 1988, and 14-year-old Anna Chabatnoy, who was murdered in 1990. The two girls had disappeared from the same high-ho shopping center in Puyallup two years apart. Their remains were found 25 miles away off State Route 410 near Unumclaw, and although Kimberly was discovered a month after her disappearance and Anna wouldn't be found for, I believe, a year or more, it was noted that their bodies had been placed in the same area, just 100 feet apart, in this hidden thicket, which could not be seen from the highway and was accessible only by foot. Now, obviously, with these similarities, the King County Sheriff's Office concluded that the cases were linked. The same person had taken and murdered both girls. And this stuck out to Corey Bober. And he wrote in his journal, quote, I thought, oh, my God. I'm sure he's going to kill soon. He killed in July of 88 and in August of 1990. And both girls came out of Puyallup. It was time. September 92, another girl will disappear from Puyallup. And maybe he'll put her too on the same highway near the other two girls as a clue in forming a three-person pattern. Maybe he's angry at the media or cops for discounting his victims and is going to finally make the fatal inference that the Green River Killer 
is from Huellip. End quote. As the puzzle pieces began to fall into place, Corey Bober launched into action, picking up the phone and calling the Pierce County Sheriff's Office and asking to speak to Tammy Horner, someone he had pestered with his theories multiple times before. Corey Bober has been referred to as a walking run-on sentence, a human flood of words, and he was known to keep people on the phone for hours at a time, expecting very little input from them. And I've recently spoken to somebody like that who... Really, it didn't matter whether I was there or not, as long as they could talk about what they wanted to talk about. And I understand the frustration that can build from being on the other end of the line, especially more than once. Terry Horner of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, she'd been caught in this trap many times before. But on this day, she didn't happen to be working. So Corey left a message during which he explained in a rush of excited words that he was predicting another girl from Puyallup would go missing and her remains would be found off Highway 410. Now, of course, the person who would be responsible for this was the Green River Killer, a.k.a. Randy Atchsiger. Now, the next day, Corey called the Puyallup Police Department, and he happened to speak to Sergeant Herm Carver, who, no surprise there, dismissed everything that Corey had to say. This is, of course, according to Corey Bober, who claims he made notes of multiple attempts to warn law enforcement about this impending crime that he was predicting. Puyallup Police Department claims they have no record of the calls, and Terry Horner, interviewed in April of 2008, said she also had no memory of Corey Bober's wild prediction. However, Captain Gary Smith, also of the Pierce County Sheriff's Office, he actually said he did remember that Bober had made this claim and this prediction, but he followed this up by stating, quote, Here's my problem. I am now the victim of implanted memories. I don't know whether it actually occurred or because Corey has told me so many times that it actually occurred, end quote. According to Corey Bober, he warned multiple law enforcement agencies about an impending crime in Puyallup on September 13th, and then four days later, Misty Copsey vanished from Puyallup, never to be seen again. On October 4th, 1992, Corey Bober discovered that his dark prophecy had come true. His mother arrived home after running some errands in downtown Puyallup, and she told him about a flyer she'd seen in one of the shop windows, about a young girl who'd been reported missing from the Puyallup Fair on September 17th. And Corey Bober was like, great, Scott, here it is. Here is this thing that I predicted. And once again, he sprang into action. He located Misty's missing person flyer. He found a Diana Copsey's number, and he dialed it immediately. And when Diana answered, Bober told her that he knew what had happened to her daughter. She'd been taken. And this was somehow connected to the other two Puyallup girls, Kimberly and Anna. Corey explained his theory and also about how he had tried to warn the police again and again that it was going to happen, but they ignored him. And now he had to tell Diana he was sorry because he had to be the one to tell her that Misty was dead and Misty's body would soon be found on Highway 410 in approximately the same area that the bodies of Kimberly Delange and Anna Chabatnoy had been recovered. Diana was, of course, at once suspicious, right? As should anybody be when somebody calls you and says this. Here was a completely random stranger calling her out of the blue and telling her he had predicted the abduction and what he was saying is the murder now of her child, an event which also happened to confirm a theory that he had developed, a theory he'd been working on for like over a decade or just about a decade. So Diana asked Corey straight out, did you have anything to do with my daughter's disappearance? And Corey assured Diana that he did not. He said, listen, I've been putting all of this together long before I ever even heard the name Misty Copsey. All Corey had done was simply notice the pattern. Now here's the thing about Corey Bober. He's very hard to figure out. He's very hard to pin down. He's been accused of being obsessed. He's been called crazy, a psycho, a loser, a pothead, even dangerous. But Corey Bober also seemed to have an almost savant's ability to see things in these cases that others had missed. According to Sean Robinson of the News Tribune, quote, he's fixated. He can be an absolute ass. And once in a while, he's right. He's researched almost 200 cases of missing or slain women in western Washington. He once embarrassed the Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office, proving the agency lost track of human remains. He compiles his information in stacks of binders. He has talked grieving parents out of autopsy reports. He has ferreted details out of medical examiners that an army of journalists couldn't obtain. He makes electronic pictures. He says there are evil images in them, and they prove he is right about who killed Misty. And then he mentions the day, place, and clock hour of some obscure moment in the investigation of her disappearance, and he's dead on, letter perfect. He reels off chains of details, names, dates, locations, and circumstances. 
end quote. And I have my own thoughts about this, which I will talk to you about later on. Despite her initial suspicions, her initial reservations, Diana Copsey found herself listening to Corey Bober for hours and hours a day. She'd never heard about the other two Puyallup girls who had vanished under the same circumstances. And I, too, also found it odd that when you look up the names Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibatnoy, you really can only find information about them in connection to Misty's case. It does not seem that these two crimes were very well documented when they had happened, which I think is unusual because of their similar circumstances. They disappeared from the same shopping center. Their bodies were found in the same location. They were roughly the same age. Why was this not reported more heavily on? Was it the media? I don't think the media didn't report on it because they love that kind of shit. Was it the police who were kind of keeping things quiet? And why would they be doing that? Why would the Puyallup police be wanting to keep the disappearances and murders of these two young girls quiet? So Corey had told Diana things that she hadn't known before. He was giving her information. The police weren't giving her information. And she felt like at least Corey was doing something. He was taking action where the police weren't. And at that point, any movement in her daughter's case was better than standing still. At this point, Diana had been told time and time again by anybody who could have helped her that Misty was a runaway. And here, finally, was someone who believed her, who agreed with her that Misty hadn't taken off on her own. Misty had encountered something or someone that had prevented her from returning home to sleep soundly in her own bed that night. So the day after he talked to Diana, Corey Bober began his crusade into making the police take Misty Copsey seriously and by default, take him seriously, right? Take his theory about Misty being a victim of the Green River Killer seriously. And then hopefully they would take him seriously when he told them that Randy Atchzager was the Green River Killer. So I think he wanted to be right in a case so that the police would say, huh, maybe he does know what he's talking about. Maybe he does have some value. And maybe we should look into his theory more deeply. So Corey first called Herm Carver at the Puyallup Police Department, and he did not receive a warm reception. According to Corey, Carver told him that he was sure Misty was a runaway, and he repeated his previous claims that her mother knew where she was. Corey wrote about this in his journal, saying, quote, he further stated that Diana was dishonest, a problem drinker, and that there was more to the case, tension between mother and daughter, that I was unaware of. He insisted repeatedly that Diana knew Misty was just a runaway, that because law enforcement doesn't investigate those kinds of cases, Diana was exaggerating the circumstances to try and make police look for Misty, end quote. Oh no, Misty's mother wants you to look for Misty because Misty's missing? What? What a bitch. What a whore. How dare she? How dare she? Carver then basically did something that I often do when a certain talkative aunt calls me, who is known to keep me on the phone for far longer than I can spare. He diverted and he distracted. He passed him on to someone else, right? So I know that I do this. Like when my aunt calls me and I see it's going to be one of those times, I'll be like, oh, Sam wants to talk to you and I'll pass it to my sister. <laughs> or even my husband have done that before. I've even foisted her upon my 11-year-old son. I am so ashamed to admit. Anyways, Carver told Bober, listen, my department's not involved with this case any longer. We figured out she's a missing person. That's not our purview. Case has been closed. The person you need to be talking to is Brian Coburn with the Pierce County Sheriff's Office. So Carver basically like was like, go away from me and call Coburn. So Bober hung up with Carver and dialed the Sheriff's Office where he was given the same narrative that he had just heard from Coburn. Misty was a runaway. Diana was a drunk. Nothing to see here. Move along. Bober did make note of something that Coburn said that sort of broke from Herm Carver's narrative. It, it broke from it, but it just elaborated on it. It wasn't like breaking from it like, oh, I actually have a hot take here and I don't agree with Herm Carver. It was like, how can I escalate what a dick Herm Carver's being and be more of a dick? So Bulba wrote about this in his journal and he said, quote, Coburn didn't waste any time saying very rudely to me, very matter-of-factly, Misty Copsey's a runaway, and I'm going to find her. And when I do, the last place I'll take her back is back to her mother, end quote. Corey Bober disagreed with Coburn. He was like, you're wrong. You're all wrong. Misty didn't run away from home. She's been murdered, and you're going to find her body in the same location as the other two girls from Puyallup. Bober alleges that Coburn responded, quote, Well, if she's been found to have been murdered, it's unfortunate she met her fate as a runaway, end quote. Diana Copsey would later confront Brian Coburn, asking him why he would say those things, and he claimed he never had. But based on the general demeanor and behavior of most of the police personnel involved in this case, I tend 
to lean more into believing Corey Bober on this one. But that's just me. You make your own assumptions. You come to your own conclusions. Corey also wrote in his journal about how Diana's checkered past had no relevance to what had happened to her child. He said, quote, the facts of Misty's case should speak for themselves. Diana's problems are not proof of what has happened to Misty Copsey. Misty had no money, was a good student, and had never run away before. She had a clean criminal record, too. And given the fact that two teenage girls Misty's age had disappeared from downtown Puyallup prior to Misty and were later found murdered, Puyallup police owed it to Diana to consider the possibilities and at least make it a high priority to find her, end quote. I 100% agree. I don't think that anybody could disagree with that statement. So for the next 10 days, both Corey and Diana made calls to the police and to the media demanding more action on Misty's case, demanding that law enforcement stop trying to push the runaway theory when there was no evidence to support that. But Corey Bober's arrest the following month would put a stop to this incessant campaign at least temporarily. On October 15th, Corey was arrested, like the police busted into his house as he sat eating dinner at the kitchen table in his mother's place. The police had placed him under surveillance for the past week. And not only that, they'd arranged for an undercover detective to set up a series of marijuana buys between Bober and this UC. And four times in five days, detectives watched Corey exchange drugs for money. So Corey Bober, who was never on really law enforcement's radar before, you know, unless he was calling them and annoying them, is suddenly this huge focus of the Puyallup Police Department. So they arrest him. They bring him into Puyallup Police Headquarters. He gets processed, you know, mugshot taken, fingerprinted. And then Sergeant Herm Carver walked in. And according to Corey, uh, Herm was in a mood. Corey wrote in his journal, quote, He walked in the room I was being held in, looking tired and pissed off. He said, I got out of bed tonight and came down here to meet you just to see what kind of a hypocrite you really are. I said, being cocky, it's not my fault, Herm, that you don't believe Misty Copsey is missing. He yelled, angry, Don't you ever call me by my first name. It's Sergeant Carver to you. End quote. This does seem like an incident or like a, a scene that would go down between, you know, like Elliot Stabler from Law & Order and any one of the the suspects that he ever interviews. You know, he's like throwing chairs across the room and like pounding his fist on the table. And he's like, it's Detective Stabler to you, you piece of scum. I know what you did and I'm going to prove it. But I'm not saying it didn't happen. It could have been dramatized. But I'm not saying it didn't happen. In fact, I feel like Sergeant Herm Carver is exactly the type of stereotypical, like blustering, male toxicity kind of police officer who would do something like that. Like you'd let somebody that you don't even know get under your skin and show you that they got under your skin just because they called you by your first name. The following day, Corey Bover was charged with four counts of selling weed and two counts of drug possession. And if convicted, he was facing up to four years in prison. Bober bailed out the next day, and one of his first calls was to Diana Copsey. He informed her of his arrest, and he told her, listen, the police are trying to silence me from bringing light to the truth about what happened to Misty and about what happened to these other two Puyallup girls. Why do they not want me looking into this? On October 25th, Diana and Corey Bober met in person for the first time, and Bober showed Diana his stacks and stacks of files, overflowing with newspaper clippings, transcripts, pictures, timelines, public records. And before she left, Corey handed Diana a copy of some phone recordings. Now, they don't say exactly what these phone recordings are, but I assume that they're phone recordings that he had set up between random people like ex-girlfriends and things and Randy Atchsager, who he believed wholeheartedly, completely 100% was the Green River Killer. So the following day, Sergeant Herm Carver put Misty's name back into NCIC, the National Missing Persons Database. And this action made Misty officially a missing person 39 days after she had vanished. And you may be like, oh, Herm Carver, redeeming yourself. Thank you, thank you. You had a crisis of conscience. You re-looked at the case and you were like, ah, oh, maybe this does look suspicious. No, no. This was not some sudden acceptance of the facts or some new moral desire to do the right thing on Herm Carver's part. Because as it turned out, it's a legal requirement that anyone missing for longer than 30 days has to be put on the state and federal missing persons lists. So the addition of Misty's name was just a formality. And in my opinion, something that Herm Carver most likely did very begrudgingly. Since meeting Corey Bober, Diana Copsey was unsure on how she felt about him. She went back and forth between feeling grateful for any kind of ally in her battle for justice 
And then also feeling uneasy about Corey's overzealousness, the way he seemed to know things, the way he seemed to just be kind of like excited about things that maybe made him look right, but also things that meant like her daughter was dead, right? I understand this kind of conflict of feelings and emotions that she must have been going through at this point. Now, during one phone conversation that she and Bober had shared, Bober was just talking on and on about how he knew that Misty was going to be found in the same area as these other two Puyallup girls. He just knew it. Uh, She was going to be found. Her body, her dead body was going to be found on Highway 410. And Diana told him, she kind of cut him off. She got a little agitated. And at one point she said, listen, if Misty does show up dead on the side of Highway 410, I'm going to kill you. And this suggests that Diana may have felt that Corey could have been involved with Misty's disappearance, at least in some capacity. Or maybe she was just tired and paranoid, exhausted with always wondering who she could trust. Now, her confusion may have been what brought Diana to the Pierce County Sheriff's Office on October 27th, where she met with Deputy Brian Coburg and showed him the recordings that Corey Bober had given her. Coburn told Diana that these recordings had been made illegally and he told her he also thought it was a very good idea for her to keep her distance from Bober and he encouraged her to file a restraining order against Bober which Diana did on October 29th. According to Coburn's notes in the report Diana had told him she no longer wanted Corey to contact her but she was too afraid to tell him because quote Corey has asked her what she would do if she stopped talking to him and he showed up on her front porch. Corey told her that she would be forced to talk to him then end quote. There was also a handwritten statement from Diana attached to the restraining order that Corey would be served with that same day, and she wrote, quote, My daughter has been missing for six weeks from the Puyallup Fair. Corey Bober has been calling me on a daily basis telling me my daughter is dead, end quote. On November 12th, Diana did not show up to the court hearing for the restraining order that she had filed. She'd called and asked it to be withdrawn. And that same day, she called Corey Bober and apologized for having done it in the first place. You can see clearly here illustrated Diana's confusion and she's sitting on the fence and she's on one side and then she's on the other. She doesn't know who to trust. She doesn't know what to believe. But she doesn't want to also isolate the only person who was helping her try to find Misty. Now, in 1991, the year before Misty went missing, the Green River Killer Task Force had been reduced to a single investigator. So it was kind of a surprise when, in November of 1992, just a few months after Misty went missing, King County Sheriff's Office Captain Michael Nault announced that the investigation was being basically reopened and revived. Nault said that it had been their belief the murders had ceased in 1984, but they now had reason to think that the killings had continued, and some more recent deaths may actually be the work of the Green River Killer. The Puyallup girls, Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chapatnoy, were added to the list of potential Green River Killer victims, and this served to reinvigorate Corey Bober's belief that he'd been right all along. He felt that if he could locate the exact spot where Kimberly and Anna's bodies had been found off of Highway 410, they would find Misty there as well. Through some contacts he had at the King County Medical Examiner's Office, Bober was able to get a rough estimate of the dump sites, and on November 11th, he and a man named Al Hensley drove out to the location to look around. Now, Al Hensley was the father of an 18-year-old girl who'd been murdered in Lewis County the year before, and this was one of the cases that Corey had been following, and like Diana, he had sort of taken Al under his wing with the promise of helping him find out what had happened to his child. Corey and Al drove around Highway 410 for a few hours, but they left empty-handed. Corey, Al, Diana, and over 20 volunteers returned to the highway on November 28th, focusing on an area near Mile Post 30 on the north side of the road. Reporters and photographs who'd been notified of the search by Corey Bober watched as searchers looked for a clue, but once again, they found nothing. Later, a dejected Diana Copsey, who now looked far older than her 36 years, told the News Tribune, quote, It's ripping me up. I'm kind of losing it, going down a path of insanity. I just want to sleep because then I can't think about it, end quote. Now keep in mind, by this point, Misty had been missing for over 70 days and no one from law enforcement had interviewed Trina Brevard, the girl who'd been with Misty the night she disappeared, one of the last people to see Misty before she disappeared, or Ruben Schmidt, who Misty had called multiple times that night for a ride. At this time, it was as if no one wanted to take responsibility for the investigation. Puyallup police were claiming that the Pierce County Sheriff's Office was the lead on the case. They were the ones who handled runaway youths. However, Puyallup were the ones who were supposed to look into missing persons cases, but no one there would accept that Misty was anything but another teenage runaway. However, I don't understand why a teenage runaway who's not made contact is not considered a missing person. What is going on? 
What is going on? Is this the upside down? But suddenly on December 2nd, 1992, Pierce County changed Misty's status from runaway to missing under suspicious circumstances. And this was followed by some confusing statements from law enforcement representatives. First, the sheriff's department spokesperson, Kurt Benson, doubled down. He defended why Misty had been classed as a runaway initially, referring to the missing persons report that Diana had filed the previous August. So they're using her previous actions against her to basically justify why they had been so negligent in this case. Now, the article said that when county investigators first learned that Misty had been last seen at the fair in Puyallup, the case had been transferred to the police there. But county investigators had continued to look into it. Benson said, quote, she's a good student. She had no contact with family members or friends that we've been able to verify. She had no money. She doesn't have a history of running away, end quote. Oh, So the two eighth grade girls and their stories that they told that Herm Carver had felt were solid enough to completely close the case and not look for Misty and then remove her from NCIC, those reports are now being referred to as unverified, which they always were. And they were never a good enough reason to completely give up on a missing 14-year-old girl. Kurt Benson continued saying, quote, I guess it would be our professional belief and experience that foul play may have been involved in her disappearance, end quote. You guess? You think? Six days later, on December 8th, Corey Bober went into the sheriff's office and told them that he knew of a car that his suspect, Randy Atchziger, had been driving at the time of Misty's disappearance. It had since been sold, but Al Hensley had told Corey he'd noticed a dark stain on the carpet of the car that could be blood. So on December 15th, the Pierce County Sheriff's Office inspected the car and found that the stain on the carpet was not blood. Also in December, Diana Copsey was at the grocery store picking up some items in Spanaway, and she spotted Ruben Schmidt in the grocery store, and reportedly she confronted him, and this caused him to run away from her. He ran out of the store. She kind of followed him. He got into an orange truck that was being driven by an older man, and then the orange truck sped away, and Diana said that as the truck drove away, Ruben was, like, talking to the man, like, very animatedly and pointing her out to this man who was driving the truck. At the end of January 1993, Diana was a guest on a broadcast of KOMO TV's Northwest Afternoon Show. During the show, people could call in with tips if they knew anything about the cases that were being talked about. And a woman did call in. And this woman identified herself as Tammy. And she said that she'd seen Misty around 10 p.m. in downtown Puyallup on the evening of September 17, 1992. She said that Misty was walking alone past the 7-Eleven store along Meridian toward the westbound on-ramp of Highway 512. And she was headed south and she had her head down. This would have been basically right outside the front gates of the fair. This woman, Tammy, said, quote, she just looked totally distressed. You know, like she was in trouble. She looked like she was crying. We didn't go up and talk to her or nothing, but maybe we should have now, end quote. This was a promising lead because Tammy's sighting of Misty would have been after Trina Brevard left Misty at the bus stop and after the bus driver saw Misty around 930 that night. But Tammy hung up without providing her contact information or even her last name, and there was no way to follow up with her. Also a guest on that episode of the afternoon show that day was Jim Doyen. He was a King County homicide detective who'd been working on the Green River Killer case for years, and he was on the show to talk about that case. But Doyen also mentioned Kimberly and Anna, the Puyallup girls that he said he could not be certain were connected to the Green River Killer, even though it will later be discovered that he'd written his notes, he strongly believed they could be connected. And although King County was not officially involved with Misty's investigation, Jim Doyen listened to Diana talk about the case, and he took note of a few things. And so the following week, Doyen personally ventured out to Highway 410, and he looked around near milepost 30. A few months prior, there had been several reports that there was a foul odor lingering in the area, so he kind of wanted to check it out. Like, was it possible that Misty had been taken by the same person who had taken Kimberly and Anna? And if so, would this person leave her body in the same location? And reportedly, Jim Doyen spent six hours at this location looking around, but like the other searchers, he found nothing. Now, almost at that same time, Corey Bober was racking his brain over the Highway 410 location. He was sure that this had been the spot that Kimberly and Anna had been left. His sources at the ME's office had been clear on that. And he was sure that Misty would be found in the same location, so he must have his wires crossed somehow, somewhere. So Bober went back to the ME's office to double-check his information, at which time he discovered that 
although the general vicinity he'd been given had been correct, he'd been looking on the north side of the highway. But the Puyallup girls had been found on the south side. So with this new and exciting information, Corey Bober quickly planned another search of the highway, which was scheduled for February 7th, 1993. But Corey didn't just put together a search. He concocted a plan that he felt might draw the Green River Killer out of hiding. Bober believed that the killer closely watched the media. And it wasn't just Corey Bober that thought this. The Kings County Sheriff's Office in the Green River Killer Task Force also thought that the Green River Killer was paying a lot of attention to newspaper articles and any media exposure that his crimes got. Bober felt that the mysterious murderer had killed in response to media reports before as a way to taunt the police and the public. So Corey called some friends he had at the Pierce County Herald which was a newspaper, and he gave them a tip about the new search, during which Corey was certain they would find something connected to Misty, now that they were looking in the right place, after all. The article went out on uh, February 5th, and then on Sunday, February 7th, Diana Copsey, Corey Bober, Al Hensley, Al's 14-year-old nephew, Jeremy Brown, and about six or seven others arrived to the entrance of a place called Waco Mainland Road, which was a gravel road east of Mud Mountain Dam. The area was sort of the entrance to a utility drive owned by a company called Wirehouser Corporation, but a security gate was blocking the searchers from continuing on until a security guard who'd been summoned arrived to open the gate and let them in. So as they waited for the security guard, young Jeremy, Al Hensley's nephew, was sort of picking around with a large stick in the muddy ditch on the side of Highway 410. And just like that, within seconds basically, Misty Copsey had no longer vanished without a trace. Jeremy stuck his stick into the dirt and flipped up a pair of denim jeans, stonewashed with fancy stitching on the pockets. And Diana Copsey crumbled when she saw the pants, later telling the News Tribune, quote, they're my pants. She had the cuffs rolled up, but they were my pants, end quote. Rolled up inside one pant leg were a pair of underwear and one navy blue sock. What the searchers may not have known at that time was that just a 10-minute walk away in a small clearing right off the graveled timbered road they were standing on, the bodies of Kimberly DeLange and Anna Chibatnoy had lain years ago. That was the location that their bodies had been dumped at. Reportedly, when Jeremy returned with the jeans hanging off of his stick, Corey Bober nearly peed himself with excitement. He was jumping up and down, shouting, I knew we'd find something, I knew we'd found something. And this struck Diana Copsey as odd, as well as it struck her sister, who was there, as odd and suspicious. The simple fact that Corey Bober had guessed the spot, and after so long, they'd finally found something there— It didn't necessarily sit right with her. But she was struggling with this pit in her stomach at the same time that she was facing the fact that her daughter was probably never coming home. And the discovery of these genes was not proving that to her. So the warehouser security guard finally arrived and he found everybody like freaking out, telling him to call the police. So he called 911. And Corey Bober called the media so that they could come down and document his amazing detective skills. By 1 p.m., King County investigators had arrived to the scene, and among them was Jim Doyen, the very same man who had searched this same area for six hours the previous week and found nothing. But Doyen, who was active in the Green River Killer investigation, also knew that Highway 410 was one of the areas the killer was known to leave victims. Seven dead women had been discovered in the nine-mile stretch between Unimclaw and Greenwater since 1984. And of course, this was also almost exactly where the Puyallup girls had been found. So Doyen began talking to people at the scene, starting with Diana, who identified all the articles of clothing found as being worn by her daughter the night she went missing. Doyen told the Longview Daily News, quote, There's a high likelihood these cases are linked. They all disappeared from Pierce County, and they all ended up in King County. I'd have to be blind to not see a connection, end quote. I wonder if that was like a dig at the Puyallup Police Department, who were not maybe blind, but not smart. And even though Jim Doyen had spent hours at this site just the week before, he did admit that he hadn't been looking at the edge of the highway, so he may have missed the clothes buried in the mud. Sergeant Herm Carver of the Puyallup Police Department was skeptical, to say the least. He quickly made notes at the scene. His notes were like, why weren't clothes strewn about, taken off victim and placed there, planted? If still on victim, wouldn't be found like that, end quote. What what do you mean if still on the victim, they wouldn't be found like that? Was there a body found inside the... Clearly, they're not still on the victim. What do you think he meant by that? I don't know. I don't know. Because what he's doing now is he's reaching. He's reaching. He's going to give himself like a cramp or pull something because he's reaching so hard trying to find a way to confirm 
his bias that Misty was a runaway. And if she's a runaway, why would she take off her jeans and bury them on the side of the road? The area where Misty's jeans had been found was roughly 23 miles from her last known location by the fairgrounds in Puyallup. Carver also made notes after talking to Diana Copsey that night. And in these notes, he claimed that she was drunk while he was talking to her. And she was talking about a funeral, you know, having a funeral for Misty. And he wrote, quote, no body, just clothes. And then he wrote insurance, which like this is clearly to me an indication that he was suggesting Diana was trying to like declare Misty dead and have a funeral so that she could collect on some insurance money but Diana did not have life insurance taken out on Misty and that may have been a fact he wanted to look into before you know making such statements. The following day on February 9th, King County brought in four scent dogs, but they did not pick up on Misty's scent. Rick Chubb, PR for Kings County, said it was possible the dogs had missed the scent because of how windy it was that day. But he promised that later in the week they would be using a helicopter with an infrared camera hoping to pick up a heat signature in the dense forest around the area. And they would have been looking for the heat that a decomposing body gives off. The helicopter went up on February 13th, but investigators were not overly hopeful that they would find anything. The head of the helicopter program, Lieutenant Frank Atchley, said, quote, there's a lot of foliage that you have to get through in order to see any heat emissions, end quote. And Bill Hagland, chief investigator for the King County Medical Examiner's Office, he wasn't very hopeful either, saying that due to the amount of time that had passed, it was likely Misty's body had already decomposed, but he was hoping that due to a few-month cold spell they'd had, there was still a chance that she was still decomposing and they could pick up on the heat signature, but inevitably they did not. So Sergeant Herm Carver, very on, clearly believed that someone had planted the genes in that location, and he was pretty transparent about the culprit being Diana Copsey. He even questioned whether or not these jeans were the same ones Misty had been wearing on the night of her disappearance. For once, Corey Bober and Herm Carver agreed on something because Bober told Diana that he also believed the pants had been planted, but not by her, by the Green River Killer, who'd been drawn out into the open by his carefully planted news story announcing the search and the search area. Corey believed the killer had removed the jeans from their original hiding place and tossed them in the ditch to throw the searchers off. And Corey now believed there was a good chance Misty's body would not be found off of Highway 410 at all. Now, there would be evidence removed from the jeans, including paint chips, you know, debris, six hairs, like human hairs, as well as the DNA of an unknown male. But we're going to talk about that next time. For now, what you need to know is an initial exam decided that it seemed the pants had been outside in the mud and in the elements for quite some time because of the way that they were crusted with mud. And it was true. The Puyallup Police Department, specifically freaking Herm Carver, were doing the most to make it seem as if Diana or Corey or both, had planted the genes there. However, the discovery of this new evidence seemed to snap a lot of people back into reality in some way, shape, or form. The possibility of Missy being a runaway seemed far less likely now that the pants she'd been wearing the night of her disappearance had showed up within a 10-minute walk of where the bodies of two girls of similar ages had been found within the previous few years. The new developments brought in a flood of tips, including one from 15-year-old Dee Dee Mills, a friend of Misty's who told police that sometimes Misty would have people over her house while her mother was working at night. And she said a boy named Reuben Schmidt would usually be at these gatherings, but he would always leave before Diana got home. And I don't need to remind you, but I will anyways. At this time, this long after Misty's been missing, law enforcement has still not interviewed a single person who had seen or talked to Misty on the night of her disappearance, which was now, in a way, a presumed murder. Meanwhile, Corey Bober was going a little manic in the weeks after little Jeremy pulled Misty's jeans from the mud. He started going ham with tips and theories, and he used Diana as a conduit to get this information to the people in the police department who had stopped taking him seriously long ago. For instance, Bober started claiming that Misty would be found under a bridge in Puyallup, and this triggered a search of four bridges in the city that turned up nothing. He also told Diana that Misty would be buried near a specific stop sign, and so she called the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, and she spoke to a detective there named Tom Coble, who went to the stop sign that Bober had indicated but he found nothing. On February 15th, Corey Bober and Detective Tom Coble met in person, and Coble said during a conversation that they were having, Bober spoke very rapidly with fragmented and rambling thought patterns. Bober told Coble about a new tip he'd received. Someone had reported the smell of rotting flesh at the Highway 162 bridge that spanned the Puyallup River. The two men took a ride over to the bridge, and Detective Coble did notice a very bad smell, smelling like something was decomposing, and he stated in his notes, quote, during the search it was evident that there was a rotting flesh-type odor permeating the area. 
I conducted a brief search on the west side of the bridge and could not locate the source of the odor, though it was very evident, end quote. He didn't find anything that could be identified as the source of the smell, but later he discovered the smell was coming from a dead raccoon. After they left and started driving to the location where Misty's jeans had been found to check that out, Corey Bober chatted with Detective Koble about the Green River Killer. Bober said that he was determined, in spite of police efforts to prevent him from acting on the matter, that he was going to prove Randy Atchsiger was the Green River Killer and that Randy had also killed Michelle Copsey. As they drove, Koble claimed that Bober pointed out like these drawn pictures of bunny heads, which were affixed to telephone poles, and Corey said that these drawings marked Green River Killer dump sites. Koble remarked on this in his notes, saying, quote, At this time, not being particularly familiar with the dump sites, I am unable to determine whether these sites are confirmed or fictitious. Nevertheless, the bunny heads were there. End quote. So something that's also odd about this case is that many articles and blog posts report that Misty's toothbrush and hair pick were located on February 20th, a half a mile from where her clothes had been found. Apparently, these two items had been with Misty the night of her disappearance. She kept them in her purse, which has not been found. This is even reported on the Charlie Project website. Yet, this three-part article on Misty does not mention this. And when I check newspapers.com, there's no reporting about this discovery, although there's a lot of reporting about the discovery of Misty's jeans. So I couldn't tell you who found these items, where they were located, what condition they were in. For instance, were they buried in the dirt? Were they thrown in the woods? Who stumbled upon them? I have no information about what seems like a crucial piece of evidence. None at all. And I find that to be bizarre. Like, did it even happen? Or did somebody just write about it in an article once and then the Charlie Project picked up on it? I don't know. But something crazy happened four days after this alleged discovery. This was really crazy, like out of the blue and and, and just unexpected. Someone from law enforcement actually interviewed one of the last people to have seen Misty on the night of her disappearance. (laughs) Crazy. Over five months after this 14-year-old girl vanished, someone who had some authority and ability to investigate her disappearance actually spoke to someone who might be able to give insight into what had happened to Misty. And it wasn't someone from the Pierce County Sheriff's Office. It certainly wasn't someone from the Puyallup Police Department. It was Jim Doyen from the King County Sheriff's Office. Doyen decided to talk to 15-year-old Trina Brevard, Misty's best friend and her companion at the fair that day and night. And he brought a picture of the jeans that had been found on Highway 410. When Trina saw the picture, she started to cry. And she said that the pants looked like what Misty had been wearing that night. They were the same color. They were baggy. And Trina also identified the navy blue sock that was found stuffed in the jeans as one of the pair of socks that Misty had been wearing that night because she had wanted to match her socks to her navy blue pullover. When Doyer asked if Misty had consumed any drugs or alcohol that night, Trina emphatically said no. Misty was straight. She was a virgin. She didn't smoke, didn't do drugs. She was clean. Doyen then asked Trina about the night of the Puyallup Fair. He asked her about Reuben Schmidt and what Misty had told her mother that Reuben was supposed to give her a ride home at one point. Trina said that she and Misty had enjoyed their time at the fair. No strangers approached them. No guys hit on them. And around 8 p.m., it was time to go home, so they started making phone calls to arrange a ride. They called Reuben first, but he didn't pick up. And Misty ended up having to call Reuben five times. When Jim Doyer asked why they'd had to call Reuben so many times, Trina responded, quote, We couldn't get a hold of him. He was gone, and then he was there, and then he was gone, and then we finally got a hold of him. And he said he couldn't make it, and we had told him things to get the money to come down and pick us up, and we'd give him more money to take us home. He still said no. There was a key under the mat that unlocked the doorknob. You go in, and I don't know how she told him where the money is, and she said, just get to the gas station, fill up, come down and pick us up. I'll give you more money to take me back home, and Trina, and he said no, end quote. So for clarification purposes, because remember, this is a 15-year-old girl, what Trina meant was that Misty had told Reuben, Okay, you don't have gas. Go to my house. This is how you get inside. This is where you'll find the money. Get some money for gas. Put it in your car. Drive here. Pick us up. I'll give you more money to get us home. Trina said that Ruben was not going to do this because he claimed he didn't even have enough gas to get to Misty's house, which was just six miles away from where he was living with a roommate in a duplex near Spanaway Lake. Trina mentioned being upset about Ruben. She said she didn't trust him because he could have just gone and gotten the money and picked Misty up and then Misty would still be there. Trina said that Ruben liked Misty, but Misty wasn't into Ruben like that. She was more into clean-cut pretty boys who were, you know, closer to her own age. Trina continued on with the events of that night, claiming that after Ruben was a dead end, she called her friend Mike Reiner, who, remember, was actually her boyfriend, 
and also a grown-ass 23-year-old man. And she called him to see if he could give them a ride, but they got disconnected during the call. It was getting later. They had to do something. So Trina and Misty walked to a convenience store on West Pioneer Avenue, which happened to be right next door to the Puyallup police station. And it was from here that Misty used the payphone to call her mother and let her know that she'd missed the bus. And as we know, Misty was told by Diana that, listen, you cannot get a ride home from Ruben, find someone else. Now, this has always puzzled me because according to Trina, they'd already been told by Ruben multiple times by that point that he didn't have enough gas to get them home. So why would Misty even suggest Ruben as a possible ride to her mother, knowing that one, he wasn't going to be able to pick her up, and two, how much her mother disliked him? If Misty spoke to Ruben five times on the phone that night, is it possible that she did have a conversation in which Ruben finally agreed to pick her up? And maybe Trina wasn't present for that. Maybe she didn't hear that part. Maybe Misty had a private conversation that Trina didn't know about. Maybe Misty had a conversation with Ruben after Trina left. So after getting off the phone with Diana, Misty and Trina sat on a bench and they tried to figure out what to do. It was getting late and Trina had to be home by 10, you know, or else her mother was going to find out what they had done lying about having a ride home. So she decided to just start walking because where Trina lived in Sumner was within walking distance, but Misty could not walk 10 miles to span away. So the girls decided that Trina would walk and Misty would take the bus. So Trina gave Misty her money for her bus fare that she wasn't going to use. And then she set off on foot around 8.45 p.m. Trina said, quote, the last words I said to her were be careful. And she turned around and told me the same. And we walked off in different directions, end quote. Trina said that Misty would not have run away from home. She had a good life. She was happy living with her mother. And Trina also said that she didn't believe Misty would get into a stranger's car. Detective Jim Doyer wrapped up Trina's interview, not knowing that she had still not told him the full story, but that would eventually come out. The truth always does. On March 3rd, Sergeant Herm Carver of the Puyallup Police Department spoke to a man named Frank Rodriguez who owned Adam's Ribs, a barbecue place on Pacific Avenue in South Tacoma. Rodriguez also happened to be Ruben Schmidt's boss, and he had some information about his part-time employee. Now, Carver did not seek out Frank Rodriguez because, once again, he wasn't suddenly filled with a passion to actually and properly investigate Misty's case. Carver actually reached out to Frank Rodriguez because he was being pestered by Diana Copsey. She was saying, Saying, listen, why have you guys not talked to Ruben? He was the one who Misty said that she was going to get a ride from that night. And the day after Misty went missing, I heard from his roommate, James Tinsley, that Ruben and his uncle had actually gone to get Misty. But then Ruben said that wasn't true. He was at a party. And Diana was like, don't you think this is strange? Don't you think that it's strange that he's saying this? Don't you think it's strange that no one's even talked to this guy? No one's checked his alibi and it's been months so Carver agreed to poke around, and he asked Frank Rodriguez what was going on, like what did he think about Ruben, and Frank Rodriguez told Carver that Ruben often talked about Misty, and Frank thought he knew something about her disappearance. So Frank agreed to sort of like grill Ruben and see if he could get some information from him, and the next day he called Herm Carver and reported having a long conversation about Misty with Ruben Schmidt, during which Ruben claimed he knew exactly where Misty was buried. According to Frank Rodriguez, Ruben said, quote, they found the clothes, but she's buried six miles from there. They're off by six or six and a half miles, end quote. Finally, Sergeant Herm Carver thought it was time to talk to Ruben Schmidt himself. Finally. The first time Carver and his partner, Detective Tom Madison, tried to, you know, find Ruben and talk to him, he saw them sitting in their squad car outside of Adam's ribs, and he was, like, walking by with some girls, and he started running. And then he sent word back to them through another employee that he would not be talking to the cops. But fortunately... Carver and Madison were able to find Ruben that evening. They finally got to ask him some questions. Although Trina had reported five calls to Ruben that evening, he admitted receiving only two from Misty. He said that during the first call, he told her he didn't have enough gas. He said she called back and told him how to get into her house for gas money, but he still said no. And he claimed Misty got really mad about this. Ruben also admitted telling Frank Rodriguez that he knew where Misty was buried, but he claimed he'd only said those things to get Rodriguez off his back, because that's exactly what you say to somebody when you want them to stop asking you questions. So what happened after Misty called? And Ruben denied her a ride. Well, that's the strange part. Ruben couldn't remember anything after getting off the phone with Misty because he had blackouts, right? He had blackouts, conveniently. In Sergeant Herm Carver's notes, he wrote, quote, Because he suffers from blackouts, he believes he blacked out and doesn't recall anything until the daylight hours of 9 1892. Ruben states on 9 1892 he drove to his grandmother's home in Buckley. She has a 100 acre farm. He doesn't know why no one was home, end quote. So Ruben's grandmother's 100-acre farm in Buckley happened to be about eight miles from the location where Misty's jeans had been found. Ruben was asked if he thought he could have blacked out, maybe went to go pick Misty up, 
at which point he could have harmed her. Rubin said he didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know what he was capable of during his blackouts. He also was asked if he'd driven to his grandmother's house with Misty in his trunk, and he answered, I couldn't touch a dead body. Ruben asked if maybe he would, could be hypnotized or go under a polygraph, and that would help him figure out if he'd done anything wrong. He knew he would never intentionally hurt or kill anyone, but during his blackouts, he knew not what he did. Ruben's polygraph happened on March 8th, and it was bizarre, to say the least. Surgeon Harm Cover noted, quote, Ruben proves to be an unusual polygraph subject, nearly fell asleep on numerous occasions, very little galvanic skin response, end quote. And Carver's partner, Detective Madison, also wrote about the polygraph exam, claiming that Ruben had basically zoned out while he was being asked questions, which made Madison feel that Ruben was trying to beat the machine. Madison wrote, quote, the results were inconclusive but leaned towards being truthful. However, Schmidt was putting himself to sleep during the actual test, which may have altered the results. Schmidt was awake and alert prior to and after the examination. It was apparent that he was trying to manipulate the results, end quote. I think that sounds pretty sus. It's clear that both Carver and Madison felt it looked pretty sus. So they probably went and checked out Grandma's 100-acre farm, right? They probably talked to her to see if she'd seen her grandson on the previous September 17th or 18th. They probably talked to James Tinsley, Ruben's roommate, to see if he left the house that night. They definitely checked his car for blood or forensic evidence, right? Wrong. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. They did none of these things. I have no doubt that Ruben was a very interesting and suspicious figure to these two law enforcement officials. They clearly say that they feel he is. But it seemed that they forgot about Reuben when another suspect came into play during a follow-up interview between Sergeant Carver, Detective Madison, and 15-year-old Trina Brevard. And that is honestly where we have to leave off today because I already know this video is going to be going on at least an hour and a half, at least, if not two hours, and there's still so much to go over. But before I leave you, let's see who made it into Stephanie's Small Business Showcase. Woohoo! Our small business today is called Flores & Co., and it comes from the lovely Michelle Luna Victoria. Flores & Co. is a Latina-owned business based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Michelle started this business in 2019 when she began making these super cool bracelets and other accessories as a way to cope with a stressful job and her partner being away overseas. She said she's always been into arts and crafts, and some of her favorite childhood memories are making bracelets with her mother. She makes these fun, colorful beaded bracelets and accessories that tell a story and encourage self-expression, and as someone who also likes to spend time making friendship bracelets as a way to relax and relieve stress. I love these. I love these, even though they're way better than anything I can make. First of all, Michelle has an Eros Tour-inspired friendship bracelet in her shop. And if you know, you know how I feel about Taylor Swift, how I feel about the Eros Tour. I love these cute, adjustable macrame plant bracelets, as well as these beautiful daisy chain beaded bracelets. They got a lobster clasp on them. But let me tell you how much I love the macrame evil eye bracelets. I dead ass always have an evil eye on me in some capacity, whether in my pocket or on jewelry in some way. So I love these. You should all be wearing evil eye jewelry because there's people out there. You may not be thinking about them, but they're thinking about you. All right. They are thinking about you. Now, Michelle's clearly way better at making bracelets than I am, like I said. So go show our girl some love. Follow her on Instagram. Check out her website. Both links in the description box. I think that these are super cute, super pretty. I think she probably can make really anything that you want. And yeah, go check it out. And that closes out another successful small business showcase of the alliteration's never going to stop. And I have to say, I'm really enjoying this. I really enjoy doing these small businesses because it makes me feel like I'm getting to know so much about you all. And on like a deeper personal level, and I love that. And like it's cool to see what everybody's doing behind the scenes. So I really like this. But that is all for today. Don't forget to hit like if you like this video. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on social media. Links are in the description box. And as always, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. I got blood, blood on the strings, blood.